international webinar series on the emerging trends in the interdisciplinary sciences and social sciences. Developing enterprise skills in disadvantaged community, new approaches from the Ellis project as topic for today's webinar. We are glad to have an eminent person, Dr. Carolyn Downs, to handle this topic. She works as senior lecturer in Lancaster University, which ranks 132nd in the curious ranking list. Within the university, Dr. Carolyn is a member of two research centers, the Center for Conception Insights in Lancaster Intelligent, Robotic and Autonomous System Center. Apart from these, she is a visiting research fellow at Manchester Metropolitan University and director of several EU-funded research projects. We welcome you all on the behalf of the Department of Management Studies of St. Pius X College Rajagurum to, for today's session. Let us begin by invoking the blessings of God. Prabhada Kiranam Tiliyum Navanam Prabhanjanata Ninkara Virudallo Nitya Prakashama Niyullil Vasikyuma Sarveshwara Nyangal Kumbidunno Vijnana Dahatta Payas kiritan nilai kani cerna na yun nori pukani, nyanatin sukanda wum nan matan kandim, snehatin matura wum niracidane, prapada kiranam tilium nawanam prapanjata. Minkar virudallo nitya pragashama ni ullil vasikyuva sarveshwara nyangal kumbidunno. Now I invite Dr. Siji Surya, Assistant Professor, Department of Management Studies, to welcome everybody gathered here. Welcome, sir. Am I audible? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, sir, you are. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone present here. And good morning to Caroline Downs. Uh, Charles Darwin once said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. Traditional workplaces and practices are fast disappearing. The new work order is one that's open, collaborative, and agile. An essential skill for the next decade will be the ability to view change not as a challenge, but as an opportunity to grow and innovate. So what is important today is reskilling and upskilling, especially at this time of the pandemic, where economy is struggling and jobs are shrinking. Educational institutions have a great duty to lead the society in this process of reskilling and upskilling, especially in disadvantaged communities. Therefore, as part of the international webinar series of St. Pius X College, Rajapuram, Illuminismo 2021, we at the Department of Management Studies are very proud to welcome you all to the second session, Developing Enterprise Skills in Disadvantaged Communities, New Approaches from the LE Projects. I'm very happy and privileged to welcome Dr. Caroline Downs, Senior Lecturer, Lancaster University, Management School, Manchester, UK. She is an ardent researcher in this area. On behalf of everyone present here, 
let me take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Caroline Downs to this webinar. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very I much. Also, I also would like to welcome Professor Biju Joseph, our principal, the chairman of this webinar to this session. We appreciate your leadership and a very hearty welcome to you, Biju, sir. Thank you. Dr. Shinopi Jose, the head of the Department of Management Studies, is with us. Dr. Shino and Dr. Caroline are close associates in various projects for a long time now. And he will be introducing Dr. Caroline to us. Welcome, sir, to this session. Thank you, sir. I would like to welcome Mr. Akhil Thomas, faculty of the Department of Management Studies. He is the department coordinator of the webinar. He will be proposing the vote of thanks to Welcome to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Sinod Skariachan, the convener of the webinar series, and the whole teaching fraternity present here to this wonderful session. I'm greatly privileged to welcome all the inquisitive research scholars, students, and everyone present here to this wonderful session. I am sure the insights of Dr. Caroline will motivate and inspire the young minds participating in this webinar. Once again, welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, CG, sir. I invite the principal of the college, as well as the chairman of the international webinar series, Biju Joseph, sir, to felicitate this webinar. Respected Dr. Caroline Downs, Head of the Department of Management Studies, Dr. Shinopi Jos, Dr. C.G. Siriak, the department coordinator of this webinar series, Mr. Akhil Thomas, respected teachers, students, and participants from other institutions. Really, it is a privilege to send Pius Tenth College Rajaviram to have Dr. Caroline as a resource person of the session. Respected Professor, I'm sure that your teaching and research experience in the areas of developing enterprise skills, especially in disadvantaged communities, would enlighten and equip us more in this particular topic, which in turn may become more useful in our learning and research. So as the head of the institution, representing various stakeholders of St. Pius Tenth College Rajaguram, I once again extend a hearty welcome to you, respected Professor Dr. Caroline Downs. And I wish a fruitful experience of learning all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Biju, sir. I would like to invite Dr. Shinopi Jos, head of the Department of Management Studies, to moderate the meeting and to introduce and welcome the resource person to the webinar. Respected resource person, Dr. Caroline Towns, Honorable Principal Professor Biju Joseph, teachers, research scholars, and students. Dr. Caroline Towns is a senior lecturer in Lancaster University Management School visiting research fellow at Manchester Metropolitan University and the director of several EU-funded research projects. Within Lancaster University, she is a member of two research centers, the Center for Consumption Insights and Lancaster Intelligent, Robotics and Autonomous Systems Center. Her research interests include work-based learning within an active research group, sharing practice and knowledge across higher education and industry, enterprise education, innovation, the use of technology, sociology of consumption and business history. She is a leading media commentator on gambling issues. With regard to PhD supervision interest, sociological and business-based approaches to gambling entrepreneurship and enterprise education, organization and management of healthcare services, business history, 
are the areas of interest in relation to her PhD supervision. With regard to the funded projects, there are at about 10 funded projects she is either she has either completed or is undertaking currently. I'm not going to talk about all the projects due to lack of time, but I must mention some of the projects due to the applicability of these projects in the context. Crafts and artisan skills for cooperative and digital enterprise and innovation games. Learning for adult social care practice innovations and skills. And there are four or five LE projects. The, today's presentation is all about LE projects. So thus, Dr. Caroline Town has been associated with the Department of Management Studies since 2016. We have attempted some international bits together though we could not be successful in the winning of the funding, we are able to proceed with some research in the projects. Examples, developing models of sustainable social enterprise for people, project, profit, and planet. We call this a PPP project. Developing entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial capacity and innovation in Dalit communities for sustainable cultures. There were some castle good applications in this project also. Work-based learning for raising aspirations and developing vocational education and training, BET, sector capability for skills delivery to employers and students in low middle income countries, LMIC. So we have submitted all these projects to UK IERI and also to UGC. At one point of time, I remember the project developing models of sustainable social enterprise for people Profit and Planet entered in the final stage of selection process and ended up as 14th among the total 60 applications all over India. But only the first seven projects received the funding. Failure is the first step of success. Hopefully, we will be able to develop a successful bid in the near future. Over to Dr. Caroline. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very nice to see everybody. Let me just try and share my screen again. Uh, there we are. That should do it. Can you all see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Lovely. So it's it's absolutely uh, thrilling for me to be here with with all of you people because I was hoping to come to Kerala uh, and in fact also to Sri Lanka in 2020 for a visit because I've been working with colleagues in Sri Lanka as well. Um, of course, COVID got in the way and we couldn't do that. So to have this opportunity to speak to you all is, is really uh, very special and very lovely. And I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the very warm welcome that I have received. And also as a practicing Christian myself, it was lovely to start the session with, with, the, with the prayer. It was, it was very, very nice and something that should perhaps be more widely adopted. Okay, so the LE projects, we're going to talk about enterprise skills. How did I get interested originally in enterprise skills? Well, because I um, think that enterprise offers an opportunity for people who to take control of their life. Um, we already heard that we're living in a, a rapidly changing world where artificial intelligence and modern technologies are taking away traditional jobs. So people will need to be more creative. Um, it, it used to be the case that you would, you would leave university or college and you would have a job for life. Um, increasingly, even people with, with very good, what would be middle-class sort of qualifications and aspirations are finding that the jobs for life have gone. So although this project is about enterprise for disadvantaged communities, the skills that we're talking about are useful for everybody um, and offer opportunities for everybody because you will need to be more agile um, and more likely to have to change your career as, as you go through it. So for, for the young, younger people here, you know, thinking about entrepreneurial opportunities is, is, um, is sensible and working out how you might progress, how you might move that way, even if only for short periods of your career is important. Okay, so how do we change it? Okay, so um, with the current project we're running is Elemental 2.0, but I'm going to explain to you how this is part of a series of projects that we've had funded by the European Union. We've been very lucky in getting a significant amount of funding over a number of years. 
So Elemental 2.0 is a community-based research and development project to improve enterprise learning. Um, it's, it's not sort of a natural thing to be entrepreneurial. Um, some people um, find it comes quite naturally to them, but for others, it is more difficult. Um, we particularly focus on socially excluded groups and we're working with a combination of community enterprise coaches, which is face-to-face -face learning plus digital learning. And what's very innovative is, is our use of live projects. So this is a current project that runs till 2022. Um, and you can have a look at the website for that, which is www.elemental.org. So as we're an EU project, we have partners across Europe um, and I've listed them here. I don't need to re 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 read them all out, I don't think. The project is led by Lancaster University and by myself and um, works in close partnership in Poland, Bulgaria, Greece and um, the UK. But the project doesn't come from nowhere. LE, LE 2.0 doesn't come from nowhere. So we started off actually with the LE project. LE stands for Employability Learning Through Immigrant Entrepreneurship. And Certainly in the UK, um, there is a long tradition of immigrants being very entrepreneurial indeed. Um, we had, for example, the large um, migration from Uganda of um, um, Indian, people of Indian origin who, who, who were sort of expelled from Uganda by Idi Amin back in the 1970s. Many, many of those people started businesses. Similarly, you know, people that came over to the UK from Vietnam, uh, the diaspora from Pakistan and India and other parts of the Commonwealth. Uh, people have often started businesses rather than um, having employment or even alongside. So we wanted to understand what we could learn from successful migrant entrepreneurs. Had they always wanted to be an entrepreneur? Why, why did they become an entrepreneur? What made them successful and sustain, sustain their business? Um, the picture here, this, this pagoda um, is a pagoda that's built by Mr. Wing Yip, who in um, Birmingham, Mr. Wing Yip came over from Hong Kong in the 1960s and um, started with, with Chinese restaurants, but then became a wholesaler of um, groceries for other Chinese restaurants. Then he developed business parks, which were, were providing all sorts of other services. Um, he also has a beautiful pagoda in the centre of Birmingham that he donated. This one is on his business park near Birmingham. Um, I had a lovely, a lovely meeting with him and, and a beautiful meal. So we wanted to learn how had he become successful and how had other people that were migrants become successful. Um, we discovered that actually most of the migrants that we were talking to hadn't ever wanted to be an entrepreneur at all. They wanted to use an existing skill or, or knowledge that they had and, and get a job in the UK but because of various issues um, I think I think in some instances prejudice but also because perhaps of language barriers on occasions people had found that more difficult and so they had sort of been pushed into entrepreneurship um, but nevertheless many of them had made made a significant success of it so we were looking at well what were the things that helped them make a success and we found that um, experiential learning was really important for them. And also, um, also that having networks or contacts, people to talk to, being able to build a network, these were the things that were important. So we developed a taxonomy of enterprise and we thought to ourselves, well, surely if um, migrants who are in marginalized communities can actually develop and sustain successful businesses. Surely we could apply some of this learning to other marginalized communities. So we came up with the Elemental project. Um, so it's Elemental because it builds on elements of the original LE project. Um, so that originally ran from 2012 to 2015, and again was funded by the EU. We then had a sort of um, a little bit of funding from Lancaster University over 27, 2018 to develop the project um, a little more. And this was looking at enterprise for communities vulnerable to social exclusion. And from the original Elliott project, we had found that there were 
socio-cultural barriers to enterprise. Um, so, so yes, of course, you've got actual structural barriers in some cases, which might be lack of money, or it might be lack of premises or lack of knowledge or lack of lack of um, language as a structural barriers. But actually, the socio-cultural barriers we found overcoming those was, was more important because most of the enterprises that were successful that we had interviewed, 200 enterprises that we had interviewed for the first project, most of them had started with um, less than 200 euros capital. So a very small amount of capital in terms of UK, uh, UK setting, but, um, but nevertheless, they had been successful. We also found that most of the small businesses we started, we, we interviewed, um, most of them had not particularly wanted to be entrepreneurs. They had, they had ended up being an entrepreneur, but, but that wasn't their initial goal. Um, and actually an interesting thing that we did find was that the people that did want to be entrepreneurs, which we had about a dozen, um, for the most part, they were very highly educated people with a very specific focus. They had wanted high levels of investments. Uh, most of them had PhDs actually, and they started very complicated businesses to do with um, technology. So that, that was an interesting thing. So we, we decided we'd do Elemental um, and we decided the key thing with, with this project was that it needed to be community led and we needed to take a participatory action research approach because one of the things that I, I've learned over the years is that top down initiatives tend not to work very well um, in groups vulnerable to social exclusion. Um, people need to feel that they have some ownership of the project and that, that their views are going to be taken into account. And, and in fact, their expertise, because of course, people that live in communities vulnerable to social exclusion, people that are socially excluded, they often have the best understanding of what the problems and barriers are that they face. And they have excellent knowledge in how these could be overcome, but they may need some support in overcoming them. Okay. So, as I said, our methodology was participatory action research, and, and that's really become um, the guiding light to all the work that I do. So this, this has been the, the research method that I have adopted for all my projects. Okay, so what is participatory action research? Um, well, it's a methodology that requires full engagement with the communities who we recognize as experts in their own lived experience. Um, the community should be engaged with all aspects of the project from sort of actually planning the research through to um, collecting of data, analysis of data and delivery of outputs. So within the Elemental project, the community helped us identify the key areas of inquiry. So when I was writing the funding application, uh, we had meetings um, with community members. Um, fortunately, because I've lived on the edge of a very poor area of um, the northwest of England for the last 30 years, and I've always been involved in the community, I have good access. Um, so, so getting access to a community is very important. If you were undertaking work yourself, you know, and you wanted to do participatory action research, it's very important that the community you're working with trust you and um, otherwise they won't talk to you and they won't engage with you and you won't get to the bottom of the problem that you're trying to identify. So they helped us identify the area of inquiry. They help with developing our research questions. And then even more importantly, we had what we called co-researchers. So the co-researchers, we had half a dozen in each country. Um, they did some training with us. They came to some training workshops to learn how to do research. Um, and they became an integral part of the project. You know, they, they brought their knowledge of the local community to us and they, they shared their expertise with the project. Um, this was a um, really, really important aspect of it. We also use creative methods um, with participatory action research and with working with groups vulnerable to social exclusion, wandering around with a clipboard and a pen to try and do a survey is not going to be very effective. Um, long semi-structured interviews are not perhaps your best way of finding that information because we've got people 
that perhaps aren't used to communicating on those levels, who are perhaps intimidated. There are power differentials that can influence the way people answer questions or the way people interpret questions. So we used a lot of very creative methods, um, unusual methods of collecting our data. We included representatives of our community in the analysis process, which again, it slows, slows things down, but it means that people have a real stake in what you're uh, doing. And also it helps you with spotting um, things that you may otherwise have missed because you know, you're not actually a representative of that community. And then we co-created solutions. We worked together to build solutions. So, so this was the process of participatory action research in the elemental project. Okay, so we also, of course, um, didn't just do the research in, in, without theory. So we, we had a number of um, theories which were important to us in um, developing our approach. So Granovetter's work is particularly important. Um, so if, if you've read Mark Granovetter, He's written a number of papers on the strength of weak ties, the importance of weak ties in building businesses. Um, also, I haven't got listed here, but it should be on here, is BERT and structural holes, which is another really, really important idea. I think actually he appears on a later slide, so you'll get the date for that there. Um, so that all of this, uh, these ideas about businesses don't work without networks. Um, all of this sort of literature is, is very, very important. And, and what sort of networks are, are people in? How can they, how do people learn about business from their networks? How do they act in networks? This sort of literature was very, very important to us. Uh, I'm not making the slide move. I'm, oh, yes. So um, Granovetta noted that um, one of the problems with a lot of work on entrepreneurship or with unemployment and economic growth is that people, researchers neglect the ongoing structures of social relations. So that was a very, very important um, insight to us in designing our work. Okay, so I said we used creative methods. And um, one of these was called, is called photo voice. Um, there's actually a sort of, um, project and an official project called photo voice which exists but we sort of adapted that version of photo voice so what we did was we gave our co-researchers cameras and we asked our co-researchers to go out into their communities and look at the opportunities and barriers to enterprise in their own communities so this was not just the uk this was um, in greece bulgaria um, Poland and the other, the other partner countries and um, we've got a selection here of images and you'll see if you look at the middle image that our co-researchers took, took a creative approach they took in fact they took some very creative approaches to collecting this information for us so so this image in the middle she's created a photo montage using a Victorian photograph and a contemporary photograph of the area of the town where she lives um, to show how the town was very busy and prosperous in the Victorian period and how um, things had changed over time and deteriorated. Um, you can see here, you know, the, the image on the left is very closely cropped to show sort of the, the closed down nature of the shops. And then we've got a, um, an image on the right of the exchange creative community. So we collected together all these photographs. Um, every, every photographer was invited to choose their 12 best shots. Um, so we provided people with, with cameras if they hadn't got a camera. And um, they brought their 12 best shots to a workshop where we discussed what these images represented in terms of opportunities and barriers to enterprise. Um, the workshop was transcribed, all the workshops were transcribed and uh, the data was analyzed. Um, so we, we used a process of coding, um, op open, open coding followed by axial coding um, to um, 
get the codes narrowed down to find out what the barriers were and the opportunities were for enterprise in the communities where we were working. Okay, so we set up quite a TOI stands for transfer of innovation. Um, it's a EU acronym that they're very, very fond of. Um, so we, we, we were transferring innovation from the original Ellie project to Elemental, and then we were going to transfer innovation from Elemental to other projects. The key things we found out with Elemental were that uh, just as Granovetter and our sort of theoretical underpinnings suggested, were that actually networks were very important and that um, our participants had very restricted networks and very limited places where they could find out about enterprise. So in the UK, we've got what the government would consider to be quite a robust, and, and in fact, in Poland and much of Europe, we have what governments consider to be quite robust um, systems and structures for supporting enterprise. Um, and the governments are always puzzled that people in poor communities don't make use of these systems and services. Well, what we discovered was that the people in our communities that we were working with wouldn't actually be comfortable going to the places where they could seek out the enterprise support. So um, it would require to perhaps go to the town hall or to go to the chamber of commerce or to go to the local college. And even though these places were, were within a reasonably short distance, you know, no more than two miles or so, that was actually um, a massive barrier to the people that we were talking to. They couldn't actually go that far. Um, in fact, we found out that they couldn't actually go to certain places within sort of 600 metres of their home if it wasn't a place they were comfortable with. So um, we found from our participatory action research approach that our people that we were working with in our communities needed sort of a transdisciplinary, we needed, we needed to understand approaches from sort of a lot of different disciplines and bring them in. And we, we need to find out, we found out that there was a sort of relationship between a soft skill shortfall, um, you know, confidence, for example, having the confidence to go to the town hall to, to inquire about the opportunities, um, having the confidence to talk to other people in your community who weren't in your immediate social network, um, having actual knowledge about how to build a network, and that's another soft skill, or actually issues with things like, you know, how to build a team, how to work in a team, um, how to um, actually actually commit, have commitment to, to a task or to a job. All of these things were the soft skills that were listening. Um, so we decided we would co-develop sort of pre-enterprise education. Initially, we had going to be develop sort of standard enterprise education, but we discovered that we needed to develop actually sort of soft skills education as a preliminary because people that we wanted to work with um, wouldn't be going online to look at how to write a business plan. It was no good starting with a business plan because the people weren't ready to develop that. So when we were thinking about transferring innovation from the original Ellie project to the second Elemental project, um, one of the key things we had to do was understand that the people we were working with had much less confidence than our immigrants, our migrants that we were working with on the first project. They had already done something really challenging. They, they had had the confidence to travel to a new country and to, to start all over again. And that confidence helped them, I think, to overcome the barriers to, to enterprise. Whereas the people we were working with, the, the group vulnerable to social exclusion, um, which really didn't have those sorts of soft skills. So soft skills education was what we needed to do. Um, we did also find, interestingly, that people's view of what an entrepreneur was acted as a significant barrier. Um, we found that in the original Ellie project and even more so in Elemental. So we found that um, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we worked with, the migrant entrepreneurs, didn't call themselves entrepreneurs. Um, they actually called themselves um, a business owner or a manager. One lady who actually employed nine people called herself a busy mum and a housewife. 
um, certainly a very busy mum and a housewife, uh, but also she was a successful businesswoman. Uh, the ones that tended to call themselves entrepreneurs were this the very small group that I mentioned before, who were very highly educated, often with a PhD. Uh, we had about eight or 10 of these people um, who started really quite complex businesses. For example, one person started um, a business making um, wind turbines, you know, required massive amounts of investment. Another lady from Greece started um, a business which wrote the programs where when you ring a company and you get an automatic voice telling you to talk what to say she 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 developed those which i absolutely hate those but she's made a lot of money from it so the idea of being an entrepreneur acted as a barrier um people had also seen programs on television and you may have similar programs in india we have one in the uk called dragon's den where people go on television and they pitch their business idea or their business to some wealthy people to get investment um we have another one called the apprentice where again you know groups of people who want to be in business go and work for a top businessman and they're, very, they're really quite aggressive and these visions of what an entrepreneur was you know somebody quite aggressive quite pushy um very very confident were, were, were frightening to the people that we were working with because they were they said well we're not like that we don't want to be like that we can't be like that therefore we can't be an entrepreneur and so so it's important to remember that sort of the language of entrepreneurship can act, can itself be a barrier. The whole idea of what is an entrepreneur can be a barrier to enterprise. Um, something's happened here. My picture's not changing. Aha! So there we are. I've got to the next picture. So we found that our participants were lacking confidence. They had very limited networking skills and very restricted networks. Um, people from a very small geographic area. And that was quite important. And, and they had a very limited amount of places that they tended to go to regularly. So places that they were confident to go to were, were quite restricted. Um, they had socially constructed perceptions of enterprise, which meant they didn't consider enterprise as an option because they thought, you know, you had to be very pushy. They thought you had to have a lot of money to be an entrepreneur. You needed a, somebody to invest a lot of money to start your business. Um, they didn't realize that most people could start a business just with, you know, a skill or a hobby and a small amount of money. And also they had very little adaptability. They, they had very set habits. Uh, they, they couldn't they weren't very good at solving problems or planning for the future. And so that was one of that, that was a set of problems that we had to overcome with our outputs. And also they had poor creative thinking skills, poor critical observation skills very little resilience so so when they met with an obstacle they wouldn't think how can we overcome the obstacle but rather they would think oh there is an obstacle in the way i can't do this um very weak into personal skills or negotiation skills which reduced their ability to collaborate generally quite poor oral communication skills and poor listening skills um as well so that that was an issue in that they would quite often misinterpret what they had heard or not quite understand it. Um, written communication skills were, it, it is a hard skill, it's not a soft skill, but um, it did impact on the way in which we would design the project. We actually designed our outputs so that they could be used by people who had really very, very weak literacy, a reading age of about five or six years old in English. Um, and we have worked with people that were illiterate and the facilitator has been able to capture the learning and support them in the learning. So we have worked with people that were functionally illiterate. People had weak emotional intelligence as well. That was quite common and issues with personal accountability or you know, lack of a work ethic. Uh, that was sometimes an issue, but the, without a doubt, the biggest issue that we found across all our participants was lack of confidence that was the number one barrier to people from groups vulnerable to social exclusion becoming entrepreneurial so that was quite a key finding so we had a co-creation oh i've missed a letter off there it says developing reigning resources i mean training resources of course so we we, we had a co-creation process and we built a training needs analysis to enable us to evaluate where people were. 
um, and we developed training resources which were very different, which are very different to conventional learning resources because a lot of the people that we're working with have had either a very poor experience of education, so they've not done well at school. Um, we have had people that have not finished the sort of formal education process. As I said, people with poor, very poor literacy skills. So we didn't want to have a, a classroom-based approach um, with a, a blackboard and a teacher at the front because we felt that would be intimidating and frightening. So we wanted a discussion-based and very small group approach. And we realised that we couldn't have our approach within formal learning settings because the people that we were working with won't go there. So we had to think, how, how could we solve that problem? What could we do to overcome the problem that people wouldn't go even, even into the school that their children went? They were not comfortable even to go in there never mind to take them to the local college or the council offices or the library, that, that wasn't going to work at all. So how did we implement this once we had had a co-creation process for the resources? Well, we had to find another approach and the approach I found was developed by Ray Oldenburg, um, who wrote a marvelous book back in 1962 called The Great Good Place. And he wasn't talking particularly about learning at all. Learning was nothing to do with it. He was talking about what it was that made a community a community. And he said that what made a community was a community places. Um, places where people felt comfortable. He called it the third place. So, so your first place was home where you were very comfortable because you know that was where you lived. Your second place was your workplace because you were used to going there and you were accustomed to that. And third place were these places in your community where you felt at home, where you felt welcome, where you felt that your opinion mattered. So we decided just we'd have to start finding out what were the great good places for our local community. And that was very, very interesting piece of work because we were working with um, some quite distinct communities. And much to us, we, and in quite small geographic areas. So in the UK, for example, we had two communities, one of only about 8,000 people, which is not a big community. It's in quite a tight geographic area, um, really, a really tight geographic area, uh, quite densely populated, very densely populated with um, small, lots of small houses. And so when you just think about it, you would say, oh, well, in such a small area, um, you know, perhaps a local community centre would, would, would be the very place, you know, that would be where everybody would be comfortable. We found that, in fact, it was much, much more complex than that. So our super co-researchers went off out again with their cameras and they went talking to people. And we discovered that for for our, for our community, for co communities that are hard to reach, uh, that, uh, that are disadvantaged, that have very small networks, that actually the places they were comfortable in were very close to their homes and were different for each subset of the community. So where your community, of eight, within your community of 8,000 people or thereabouts, we were working, for example, particularly with um, people who had chronic long-term health conditions, we were working with recovering substance abusers and we were working with young people who were not in education, training and employment. That was the groups in the UK. And we found that for each of those little subsets, you had a different place where they felt comfortable. And, and so for the young people, the places where they were, they were going, young people not in education, training and employment, the young men in particular could unfortunately be found in the betting shop um, actually, because they were poor, they weren't really betting. But the reason they were going to the betting shop was because the betting shop had free tea and coffee and a big television, and they could sit there and um, you know chat and be around each other. For the older people that were um, with long-term health conditions, there was actually there were actually a local, couple of local cafes where they felt comfortable and at home. And uh, for our recovering substance abusers, we actually found that. The, the picture of Burnley Market Hall is here. Uh, we actually found that, um, that we were working in East Lancashire for, with our recovering substance abusers, not quite in near, not quite near Lancaster, about fifty miles away. We found that actually 
they liked going to the market and meeting up with people and they felt comfortable in the market. So we discovered that what we needed was a place to run our education program, to run our training program. We needed to be in these very little non-traditional places where you wouldn't expect to be running an education program. So you don't expect to run an education program in a market hall or in a cafe. Um, we have a picture on the right, bottom right here of, of a, a community music hub. So they, they do um, electric guitars and drums and recording facilities for young people. And they also run our program. Um, in Greece, we were, we were running the program in, a, in the back room of a bakery because the, the, they, they were working with older women who had been out of the workforce and um, needed, now needed to, to, to start to get an income. And they found that the, the women always went to the bakery every day to buy their, to buy their bread. And that was where they felt comfortable. So it's very interesting, the places that you need to work. They're not where you would think. And we also found that you needed to have very small groups. And really, four people or five people at a time is the most that you can train in, in this session. So what are our key innovations from Elemental? Well, we had community access points. So that is a process for identifying the setting in your community where you might be able to offer training where people feel comfortable to go. We identified that actually you couldn't train people to become to do to enterprise by starting with a business plan, but first of all, you had to improve their soft skills. They were not in any way ready to start thinking about what business they might start. We innovated by co-creating our learning resources with representatives from our end user groups. And we also developed the learning approach, which is, as I said, very small group based and discussion based, no, no blackboards, no chalk, no, here you will do this test, we could you couldn't have any learning like that, because that doesn't work. So so we, we developed all those, those are our key innovations. So we then had a pilot and a rollout process. Uh, so we, we had a, a pilot for the EU. And you can see there, the, this is actually the resources, the resources are all available for free. To download on our website um, there, there's the workbook and there are the cups of coffee and you can see that there are three people involved in this training process here and actually you can't see there's actually a facilitator um, so this was in a little cafe that we, we, we took we took part in because it runs on small groups we decided that the most effective way to roll this out was to train people to deliver the program in our way so we, we trained people how to, to, how to deliver the program. Um, and we measured hard outcomes and soft outcomes. And we compared ourselves with other similar interventions to find out how well we were doing. So the hard outcomes we measured were what happened to people who took part in our training program in terms of going on to either further education, uh, to gaining a full-time job because the actual program is suitable for employment skills as well as enterprise skills and if they started a business so there was those were the hard outcomes did they go on to employment did they go on to enterprise or did they continue with education uh, soft outcomes we have um, a pre and a post training questionnaire which measures things like confidence um, size of networks and so on, um, which we, we could actually look at, well, did their scores improve from the beginning of the, before they started the program to when they completed the program? And we looked at comparator interventions. Comparator interventions was a little tricky um, because ours is, our program is so unique, but we did find um, an evaluation of 27 interventions with unemployed people, uh, long-term unemployed people, which were to do with uh, getting them into jobs. And we use that as a, a comparator. So that was quite a substantial study. Okay, so what did we get? These are our results. Okay, so this is not all participants, I must emphasize. These are tracked participants, participants who we were able to keep in touch with or who in the case of London and Greater Manchester, who other people were able to keep in touch with for us. So we know that many more people have been through the programme than are listed here. 
uh, because of um, downloads and also of contacts with other people. But we don't have um, detailed information for all of them. So if you look at the data, and I, I don't know how well you can see this, but I'm happy to share slides with people afterwards. In fact, I've you've already got the slides. I've, I've emailed them over so they can be shared if you want to see them. So if you look on the left left hand column, we've got which cohort they were and when they were taking part, when they took place. We've also got um, a code that relates to helping me find the actual data on the original data tables. So um, you can see how many people started the pro in, each, in each setting, how many people completed, how many of them moved on from elemental and a percentage success. And this is moved on from elemental to a hard measurable success. So as I said, education, employment or starting an enterprise. So we've got rates, the lowest, the lowest rate we've got is 40% from our North, one of our North Lancashire pilots, um, four out of 10 moved on from elemental. Um, and you might think to yourself, well, that doesn't look very good, but this was actually a group with learning, quite significant learning disabilities. Um, so all of the groups that we're working with are people with, with significant issues, either long-term unemployed, long-term health, mental health problems, and so on and so forth. This is just data from the UK, by the way. I've not put in the data from Europe. Now, we've broken that down more here on this table with what happened. So of the 40% from London, sorry, there was more than that in London. Let me go back to the previous slide. So 66% in London moved on. And then you can see from that, four of them went into employment and two of them started businesses. Um, Greater Manchester, we've got three going into employment, one going into business. Um, if you look at the North Lanks pilot, three of them started businesses and one of them went into education. So you can see where people went to. Okay, so that's quite useful. So this is comparison with similar interventions. Now, as you can see, our lowest success rate, if you remember back to the slide, was 40% of people moving on. Um, Rolf et al. evaluated sorry, 17, not 27 interventions with groups vulnerable to social exclusion. And these were very expensive interventions as well. Um, some of them cost over £8,000 per person. Um, so an awful lot of money. Uh, ours doesn't cost anything like that. Ours is very, very cheap, our, our mod model. 28% um, of the under 24s in the evaluated interventions moved into employment. 22% of people aged 25 to 60 moved into employment. Only 10% of people with chronic health conditions or disabilities um, in the studies evaluated by Rolf et al, um, in the interventions evaluated by Rolf et al, moved into employment. So you can see we have a significantly higher success rate and at a much lower cost, because as I said, if you look at the Rolf et al study, you find that some of these interventions cost massive amounts of money. So we'll give you some case studies of some of the people that actually started businesses. So Graham took part in our project in 2015. Graham had been out of work due to disability for over 10 years. Um, he had very, very small networks. And uh, if you look at the bottom picture, that's a picture of the cafe that he now runs. So Graham, had used um, some of his, his hobby, which was bowling. This cafe has actually got a bowling green nearby and Graham had been a, a county bowler and a, a bowling coach before disability prevented him from doing that. But um, with, with, after our training course, um, he wrote a business plan, he got, he got the cafe. He then was able to get funding to um, start bowling classes for people with disabilities because he, he used our networks to apply for a grant from the local power station who give out charitable grants. Um, he now employs three people. So he's not just employed himself, he employs three people. Lee is a really interesting one from one of our Greater Manchester cohorts. So Lee had had two severe strokes and could no longer work. He, 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 did, he, did, um, he was a forklift truck driver in warehouses of course, because he'd had strokes, he had to give up his license. It wasn't safe for him to drive a forklift truck. He had become agoraphobic. He didn't want to go out of the house. He was very depressed. 
he came to our course because it was actually next door to his house and um he was he was able to walk that far uh, because you know it was so close so that was why he came on the course as a result of that he, he built his confidence he identified that actually although he couldn't do warehouse work himself um, he actually did have good networks and he started a business providing warehouse staff to cover for sickness um, he is still running that business two years later and he's doing well Taslina um, has had never worked Taslina came from a British Pakistani family and um, she took the course just because um, she used to go to the local library and she saw the course advertised there. It was very by her ha house, very near to her house again. Um, so she came on the course. She then decided that she would go to education and she went and did a childcare course because she thought that would help her with looking after her grandchildren. As a result of doing the childcare course, she decided she could become a childminder. And so she became a registered childminder. And as a result of running the childminding business, she now looks after three children, enabling three other mothers from her community to leave their children in a safe place, uh, where, which they feel is culturally appropriate. And um, she's, she's still doing that. Pavel's an interesting guy. So Pavel came to the UK from Poland. He was one of our young people, not in education, training or employment. Um, he was running wild by his own admission at the time. Um, he's come here as a child and he was he, he'd sort of fallen out of school and was running wild. After taking part in our programme, he set up a digital marketing business. That became very successful. And now he is the European director of a, a very large digital marketing company that is a household name, which I won't mention. Um, Carol was a lady with drug and alcohol problems, alcohol actually, not drug problems. Um, she had previous, she did have very good skills previously because she had been a solicitor, but she was struck off because of her alcohol problems. So of course she couldn't go back to that work. She'd become very depressed. These are all, by the way, pseudonyms for these people's names. She had become very depressed. And um, then she came along to our course. As a result of that, she, did first aid training and then set up a business training other people to do first aid. Steve, again, is another one of our um, drug and alcohol cohort. Uh, not, and again, alcohol. Steve, again, is a very clever guy, had a PhD in um, industrial chemistry, but uh, had been living on the streets. So he'd really come down in the world. Um, he's now running a business collecting plastics from the beach. Plastics are recycled and made into um, products which are sold in various markets. And Andrew is a success. Um, he's mental, severe mental health problems. Um, again, another very clever guy. He has now got a fully funded PhD. So we, there's some of our case studies. We're very, very proud of all of them. Um, what are we doing now currently? Building on Elemental. Okay. So we talked a bit about Ellie. 2.0 at the very beginning, which is our current project. Um, what had happened was that people, trainers who have de delivered Elemental said, well, what about the people who don't go on? We need something for them. And there are lots and lots of enterprise education programs available, but they felt that they weren't suitable. They wanted something that um, was more experiential and more like the original um, elemental program in the way that it approached working with people so um, we we looked at how we could use community enterprise coaches based in our caps our community access points so in the local places where people were comfortable and how we could make live projects so what's a live project well the community enterprise coach goes out into the local community and talks to maybe existing small businesses, maybe the local school or the local health centre and says, well, you know, what, could, what would you like to, to, to do? What would you like to find out? Do you, would you like some marketing research doing? Have you got an event you want promoting? And they assist the trainees in developing whatever it is, small project, it is a small project that the, the local organisation or business wants. And then they present that to the business and, and it helps with building their confidence and it builds their business skills. So that's that's what we do there. We've also started looking at community wealth building and that's a very, very interesting aspect of this project because um, 
here is a definition of community wealth building. So it's an asset based approach to bottom up, equitable, inclusive and sustainable economic development. Um, we we've been. Um, we've, we've got good access here to a, a very successful community wealth building initiative called the Preston model, um, which is about 20 miles down the road from where, where I currently am in Lancaster. And the way that works is that the civic authorities in, in Preston um, and the hospital and the university, so, so, so big organisations, committed to spending initially £70 million pounds or thereabouts in the local community. So rather than spending their money on with big corporations, they worked out ways of actually allowing small local organisations to tender for contracts and help them in doing that. And they diverted money from, from going out of the area back into the area. Um, that's the sort of nub of community wealth building. It's based on what we call anchor institutions. So which are larger organizations, multinational corporations and so on, HEIs, FE providers, hospitals. So these anchor, these larger organizations, these anchor institutions commit to working with smaller organizations or to, to putting in routes to support individuals. And we felt that this could be very, very useful in terms of not just through giving contracts, but in terms of these larger organizations sharing their knowledge of networks, because as, as we said at the beginning, one of the key problems that the, the people that we're working with have is that they don't have networks. You know, their networks are very, very restricted to usually to close family and one or two people outside the family so they've got very small networks so we've been looking at how anchor institutions can share not just contracts but networks um so i've already talked about grand adventure i knew i've got bert on here somewhere structural holes it's, there is a real need for networks um in order to help our communities vulnerable to social exclusion to help them to develop new skills to develop new opportunities and so on and so forth so We've been doing some network identification and building. So if you look at um, Fatima, who's one of our trainees, so she's got a large family network and dotted line indicates that this is a sort of what we call a, a, a bridging or a bonding network. So, so that's she can, she can relate to and access people in her family, 29 people. And then from her family, she's got eight family members with businesses, which is actually an awful lot of family members with business businesses but this is um, a third generation migrant family and they, 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 they commonly do have businesses and then she's got a network with the adult education center that she goes to where she she you know six people and she's got a network with college because after the adult education center she did go to college and there are 17 people 16 people other students and one particular tutor that she knows that's a very small network really in terms of actually Fatima starting a business unless she can make use of her family members businesses however if we look at Graham who I mentioned earlier with the cafe Graham had got quite a lot of family and friends 32 but then he's got 17 people at the bowling club he's got the bowling league another bowling league and we and the county bowling because he was a county bowling because he's got a much bigger network which he learned to make use of but what helped him particularly was building networks in terms of the anchor institution which um was through the health center that he found out about the power station having these grants available and through two third sector organizations which helped him with then writing a, a detailed business plan to rent the cafe and also helped him in terms of um, putting his bid together to the power station to get the money to enable him to develop his business. So networks really, really important. Um, as I said, accessing resources is a structural issue. Um, most of the LEK studies, that's the initial project, 191 out of 200 in fact, started with very small or no capital. Microfinance is important in terms of people from um, disadvantaged communities starting businesses. And of course, microfinance is an idea that started in India with the Grameen Bank. 
and also the role of anchor institutions, because it's not just about giving out contracts. An organization like yourself could help with network sharing, with confidence building activities, and with helping people learn how to, for example, you know, contract with a larger organization. So it doesn't just have to be money. You know, there are other things that can be done. Um, here are some testimonials from some of our trainees. Um, you can see those there. And this is the last slide, which has got um, our website on it and our disclaimer. And that is the end of the um, presentation. And I hope you've enjoyed that and found that interesting. Thank you, Dr. Caroline. Hello, thank you. Hello. Can Hello. you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Emelda, Emelda, please continue with it. Dear participants, it, uh, it's the Q&A session next. So if you have any questions, um, please put it in the chat box or please unmute your mic and ask our dear person. Dr. Karoli. Hello. And, uh, Dr. Gigi Gumari. Uh, Ma'am, you are very nice presentation, and I am very much impressed about the methodology that you use. That is a participatory action research. Okay, then, ma'am, uh, my doubt is that uh, how can we associate uh, the demographic characteristics and entrepreneurship development among the marginalized communities? Sorry, can you just repeat that again? How can you? How can you? Did you say associate? Yeah, that's my question. How can we associate the uh, demographic characteristics and the marginalized communities develop entrepreneurship development? The de demographic characteristics and the demographic characteristics like age, sex, color, caste. Yeah, and... I know what demographic characteristics are. How do you associate that with entrepreneurial characteristics? Did you say that? How can we connect? Is there any association between these two entrepreneurship? Okay. Development? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I beg your pardon. Okay. So wh what we've been doing is um, rather than looking at individual participants or individuals demographic characteristics, we've been looking at a community. So we're identifying communities that are um, considered by government data to be vulnerable to social exclusion. And then anybody within that cohort has been included in um, our activities so so that makes you eligible for participation um however if we look at the first project the um original ellie project where we were looking at migrant entrepreneurs we did find actually um that there was a significant difference between um male and female entrepreneurs and between younger and older entrepreneurs or younger and older at the age at which they started their business so we found that uh, younger people in the original cohort were more likely to turn to enterprise and um, more likely to have to seek external funding and to have wider networks. This is in the original project with migrant entrepreneurs, not with our groups vulnerable to social exclusion. Um, we also found that there were some differences in the types of business started in that we found that women tended to be more creative actually in the types of business that they started and more likely to be able to adapt existing skill sets so for example um we had one lady who a refugee lady actually from um nigeria who wanted her, her children to get to know the, the new the children in her new school and so she thought, well, I'll find out how to, I'll organise a party for the, for the other children. And um, she, she organised, she looked in the library and she found out what was a traditional English children's party like. And she organised a traditional English children's party. And other parents were very impressed with this and said to her, oh, you know, what did you do? And could you organise, help me organise my own party? And so then she started a party organisation business. Um, so that, that was sort of a very creative thing. Whereas we found that our male participants tended to look very specifically to previous employment skills and then transfer that to starting a business. So we did find a difference, a gender difference there. 
and as I said, an age difference. But with regard to the Elemental and LE 2.0 projects, we are using government data on what communities, what different groups constitute people that are vulnerable to social exclusion. So, you know, it's levels of income, levels of disability and so on. And we're working with that as a sort of whole unit. Is, is that okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we've got lots of questions in the chat now. Yes. Um, yes. Carolina, I may I ask one question? Yes, of course. May I ask one question? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so with participatory action research, you mean to say, even a training program or workshop would become part of research provided if it is well recorded or a good follow-up is made? Yes, in fact, you can. You, you certainly can use the training workshop to provide continuous data and to become part of the participatory action research because, because it's designed, because the learning activities are designed to be collaborative, um, they, they work very well for that. So you can do that. Um, we haven't actually done that, but we have noted that there is definitely the opportunity to do that. Okay, thank you, thank you. There are some questions in the chat box. You may please look at them. Yes, so, so the first question I have here and thank you very much to everybody who's written questions. So it's from Vishnav says, what are the central reform current and governance challenges that the report will need to consider? Well, I think it, uh, do you mean the, um, I think you may mean that rather than the report, the, the, the actual um, training program. Um, one of the key issues that we've got in terms of, um, is, is in terms of government, government policy. So for example, in, in the UK, in particular, um, people who are from the groups that we're working with are often receiving a government allowance, a, a monthly payment, for example. And it's not possible. They've either got to receive the government payment or they've got to work. Um, there's very little in the way of recognition of the fact that they might need some government support for quite some time if they start a new business. Um, there, there is a mechanism by which they can get some support for 12 months. But where we're working, particularly with people with disabilities, um, often they can only work in the business on a part time basis. And that, that, that wouldn't be enough to live on full time. And yet there's no route for sort of part time government support. So, so that's a, a, an important challenge that we need to overcome. And we, we, we are providing white papers to the government to various um, aspects, elements of the government, you know, so for the Department of Employment, for example, and the department, um, the department that provides disability benefits to give them information about what could be done to sort of reduce the amount that they have to pay in support for these people, but to still allow them to have some support. Um, so we have some barriers. This is from Ath Athulia. Um, says we have some barriers like lack of confidence, little, adaptab little adaptability and flexibility as well. So how can we overcome these barriers? Well, certainly um, our training program is available for free and it has activities and you can do that. I think actually um, you have to take very small steps to overcome barriers like little lack of confidence. You have to make um, it possible for people to try new things and to try new opportunities to overcome lack of confidence. Um, little adaptability, you know, it's a, it's a matter of mindset, thinking about how your mindset is. And sort of, again, our training program provides people with uh, different case studies um, and problems to try and solve for other people, not for themselves. And, and then you can often see, people can often see, well, I can solve that problem for the case study person, maybe I can also solve that for myself. Um, do please tell me if you think you want another, you know, I'm not answering the question in detail for you. Um, Renuka says, how can we ensure effectiveness of case study in fields like medicine, education, psychology, and political science? Well, case study methodology is something that I actually do teach to my um, PhD students. I, I, I particularly specialize in case study methodology. Um, in the case of this project, we don't really, we, we don't create case studies from the research. What we have done is created case studies for the training. Um, but the, those are, um, 
I suppose, used in the field of education because we, we write little case studies for the students and then the students or the participants um, sort of use the case studies as a springboard for discussion and so on. I think if you're using, I think case studies are very useful in terms of teaching as well as in terms of um, the sort of work that I'm doing. And I'm sure that your, your institution would use case studies. Um, can we make social change in our entire society through CAPS? Yeah, I would say you really could, actually. I think understanding that community access points are really important to the people in that community, the people that use them, and that actually they're far more, for example, than just the local shop or just a cafe or just um, the market, whatever. Actually, they're places where people exchange knowledge. Uh, so, for example, if you're looking at vaccine hesitancy um, with the COVID vaccine, I think that a lot more could be done through going out into the, to the community, finding out where the community access points are, and then finding who is a trusted person within that community access point and using them to give the messages to people because people trust those people. They trust that place and they feel safe and comfortable there. And you can open up a discussion where people don't feel that they're being lectured at, but rather that they are being treated as an equal and that their concerns and their ideas are taken seriously and respected. So I think we can do that, but I think you have to recognize that the cats might not be the places that you expect them to be. So you might think to yourself, aha, you know, all the mothers take their children to this local school. So therefore this local school will be a place where they feel comfortable. I think if you investigate it, and we have a toolkit to help you identify CAPS on our website, when you investigate, you might find, well, actually, no, the teachers are, are, are quite powerful and bossy and the parents and the mothers are not very comfortable going to the school. We just go there because they have to. They have to go and take their children. They have to go and collect their children, but they don't feel confident in uh, or valued in the school, whereas actually they feel confident and valued um, at the bakery. Uh, where they go to buy their bread after they drop the children at school. So I think we can make social change through CAPS. And I, I think that looking into that is a really useful thing. So is it Soraya? I don't know how you pronounce that name exactly. What are the features of skills programmes that succeed or fail to generate opportunities for employment and higher income? I think the key thing is that the ones that are successful, or uh, and we've been very successful, are that it is not a traditional didactic teaching method, but rather that it is collaborative inquiry where it respects people's existing, pre-existing knowledge and their uh, opinions and skills and makes them feel more confident that, that they've got an idea. So collaboration, I think, rather than didactic teaching. Uh, maybe this is Sneha said, how does the participatory action research help you find solutions? And why did you choose this research method? So I chose this research method because working, I've, I've always been um, a, a sort of volunteer uh, on lots and lots of different things all through all through my life. So I've, I've worked with within disadvantaged communities all through my life doing various different voluntary activities. And I've realized that people in those in, in the communities quite resent top-down initiatives where the, the government come in or where the health authority comes in and says, oh, do it this way, this way is better, do it our way, well, here is some funding. And also these projects tend to be short-term. And so, so people will join in while the funding's there, but then it stops and, and people don't trust those methods. Participatory action research is bottom-up. It says to the people in the community, you are experts in your own lived experience and um, we acknowledge your expertise and we will come here prepared to learn from your expertise and we value your input. So that makes, I think, everything much more sustainable and it makes for much more open relationships. So, so if, if a government official comes in and they do come in, with their clipboards and says, well, answer me these questions about, um, you know, vaccination uptake in your community. 
everybody resents it. People don't want to answer the questions. They ignore the person knocking on the door or they, they don't give them detailed answers. But when you come in and say, come and tell us how you would like to do things, come and tell us what you know as an expert about your community, and we're just going to sit here and listen. You can tell us how to do it. They much more value that. And we often provide food. We, in fact, we almost always, until we've had to go online with COVID, we would always provide food at our events and opportunities for socialising, um, you know, and things like that. And, and I think that helps people relax. It's, 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 it's more of a, a social activity as well. There's a social element and um, a recognition that people, people, we mustn't forget the social, which is what Mark Granovetter says. Um, so where am I at? Uh, Viraj says, what is known about the successes and failures of wider vocational, uh, vocational and wider training programs in reaching socially disadvantaged groups? Well, as I said, there's the Heather Rolf evaluation in 2015 of um, 17 quite large interventions organized by local government and national government to um, encourage employment amongst hard to reach groups, which found that the, the traditional interventions were not very successful. Um, so, so basically that is what is known. Um, there are not many evaluations of such things, but that's the one that I know about. What are the main skills involved in the case study, says Emmanuel. Um, I think the key, key things when you're developing case studies is to make sure that you've got solid information and to make sure that you've got information from quite a wide variety of sources um, so that you can pull things together properly. And I think that's the things key to successful case study. Um, someone else has said, uh, Remya says, what are the good qual main qualities of a good case study? Well, the main qualities of a good case study is that it's got breadth of information as well as depth. So um, I have actually had some PhDs, because I had a PhD to look at last year um, to examine, and the case study, it, well, it said at the beginning that it was case study methodology, and I read the PhD and I thought, where are the case studies? I can't find a case study in this PhD. What the student had done was had interviewed um, informants and had a lot of interviews, but that was it. So although they told me in the PhD that they had taken um, observations and, and made notes, they, they hadn't been included to present a case study. They were working in um, an organization, but they hadn't provided any information about from the organization website and so on, all which could have added depth to the case study, but none of that was in there. So they weren't really case studies. Sadly, the person had to go and um, spend six months rewriting their PhD. Um, feedback form from everybody. So I think that's, oh, community-based enterprise development. Yes, I can do. Okay, so um, who said that question? Sri Lakshmi says, can I please explain about community-based enterprise development? So um, this is the work that I've been doing in, particularly in Sri Lanka with the handling weaving communities with uh, my colleague at the University of Moratua. And what we're looking at there is um, that although on the face of it, the handling communities are entrepreneurial, in fact, they're not really because they rely very much on middlemen to uh, provide raw materials and to get the, the products to market. Um, this means that uh, the um, status of the handloom weavers can be quite low, that they don't really make as much money as they could do from their very highly skilled craft activity. Uh, the whole idea of community-based enterprise development is that actually you teach the community um, enterprise skills and improve their confidence and you um, help them with network development as well because they need to develop wider networks. And the, the community as a whole, instead of working as individual families, for example, work as a community enterprise. So um, one of the weaving communities, the Man Manandapella weaving community, is actually moving quite significantly to a community-based enterprise. And this is a community that has developed its own supplier links now with um, 
raw material suppliers actually in Kerala. So I hope that helps you there. Anybody Any more questions, please? Any more questions, please? Hello, Dr. Don. Hello, Dr. Don. Yes, hello. Okay, I am Sinos Karyachan, a faculty in microbiology. Uh, I'm extremely happy to listen to your talk and it was really wonderful and no really very useful information about your Elite uh, participatory project and the, the insight you have presented uh, in this, uh, through this study. My doubt is, my question is, uh, uh, when, you are, uh, when you have selected the criteria for the selection of the participants, and it seems there are a lot of uh, shortfalls in terms of uh, their networking and their social communications and in terms of resiliences and all those things. And what was the specific rationale you have selected you have look you have, you have used all these particular criteria for your studies that is one question and uh, how did you compare what was your uh, you know control group of your studies and in comparison with the control group and what is the you know the insight the thought you wanted to uh, give out of this particular study can you okay tell you Thank something you. about this thing yes so yeah. i can tell you something about that so with regard to the funder of this study, so we're funded by uh, the European Union um, Erasmus Plus stream of funding. So actually all Erasmus Plus projects, although they have significant elements of research in, they have to be about developing education or developing training. So because of that reason, we don't have a control group at all as such, um, except that if you look gen more generally at outcomes for um, different social groups. Um, the UK government, for example, measures outcomes by what they call super output areas, which are um, small geographic chunks, basically, of the UK. And within those super output areas, they will the government collects data on the proportion of the population that, for example, um, have an income of X or Y or Z, uh, that have health outcomes of, you know, sort of based, I think, upon chronic health, if I know, based upon sort of levels of chronic health conditions, based upon um, average age of death and so on and so forth, based upon levels of alcohol use. So we are selecting people uh, because the European Union focus is on supporting people from groups that are disadvantaged. We are bound to select people from those super output areas which have a high proportion of people that meet those criteria. Um, similarly, we don't have um, a control group as such within the initial project because the whole idea of the project, the whole idea of the funder is that we will improve you know, learning opportunities or learning outcomes, um, in this case for enterprise education. However, if we compare the outcomes of our trainees, our participants with people in the same geographic area and in, with the same financial and health circumstances, we see that the people who we are tracking, where I provided the data tables, we see that the people that we are tracking um, have much better income levels of income. They're, they're no longer needing to have government benefits, for example, and government benefits are really subsistence level. So that they're, they're, they're moving up in terms of having much better income. We see that they are employing people themselves. So they're providing an income for sort of neighbours and friends and family, um, which removes more people from the government benefit system. And it would be expected, although we would need a longer term study, it would be expected probably that their health outcomes would have improved as a result of uh, the participation in the project and moving on from the project onto employment or starting a successful enterprise and sustaining it, or going into education. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dong. No problem. Emelda, please carry on, Emelda. Emelda. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Please carry on. Yes. Dear participants, due to the lack of time, uh, it's time for us to wind up the Q&A session. Um, thank you, Dr. Carolyn, for answering all the questions. Um, they were very interesting questions. Thank you to everybody for asking them. It's our pleasure, Dr. Carolyn. Dear participants, please pay attention. The feedback link is given in the chat box. Kindly fill it. 
Now I invite Akil Thamusar, Assistant Professor, to deliver the word of thanks. Good afternoon, one and all. Principal Professor Bidu Joseph invited Chief Guest of the session, Dr. Karen Downs, Dr. Shino P. Jos, Head of the Department, Dr. C. G. Sriye, Dr. Sinod Sariachan, respected teachers, research scholars, and all the participants. It's a matter of pride for me that I am proposing a vote of thanks for this webinar. Many people from India are migrating to European countries for jobs, better lives, and for starting on business ventures. LE project reflects the experience of immigrant entrepreneurs in European Union. LE project advises policymakers and regulators on how best to support immigrant entrepreneurs. I hope few among us will migrate to Europe in future and will start on business ventures there. Definitely, LE project will be a guideline for future immigrants who wish to start on business ventures in Europe. I am sure that ALI project will widen the window of investment to Europe. Thank you Dr. Downs for doing such a great collaborative research which will benefit generations and sparing your valuable time for explaining it to us. It was a very enlightening experience for us. Thank you Dr. Carolyn Downs. I Thank you very much. I take this opportunity to thank Sri Bitu Joseph, our principal. Without his impressive leadership skills and incredible passion for the students, Illuminismo 2021 would not be a reality. Thank you, sir, for your valuable support. I thank Dr. Shinopi Jos, our beloved head of the department, Dr. C.G. Suryek, and Dr. Sinosh Karyachan for their untiring efforts to make this webinar a huge success. More than 200 participants, including teachers, research scholars, and students from our college and from various other colleges participated in this program. I thank you all for making this webinar a grand success. Thank you all once again. Thank you, sir. Once again, I take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Carolyn for your wonderful and informative session. Thanks a lot for being a part of this. By thanking everybody who participated in this webinar once again, I conclude the meeting has officially ended. Thank you.